Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar on improving transmission cost estimates. My name is Andrew Mills, and I'm a research scientist here at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And I'm just going to go through a few of the logistics for our presentation today. It'll be about a 45-minute presentation. We'll leave some time for Q&A at the end of it. Everybody's going to be in listen-only mode during this presentation. And so we do have a chat box that's on the, the left-hand side that uh, you can insert any questions that you have. And we'll accumulate those questions during the presentation, and then we'll turn to those and start to answer them at the end of the presentation. And then anything that's left over that we don't get a chance to get to, we'll try to follow up afterwards um, uh, via email. Will Gorman is the person who's going to be uh, presenting today. He led this work, uh, and he's been working with us here at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab for over a year. He's currently a PhD student in the UC Berkeley at the Energy and Resources Group. He has a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from UT Austin and worked for three years as a senior research analyst at the Brattle Group, where he focused on issues around renewables and wholesale electricity markets, among other topics. This work was also supported by Exeter Associates, where we worked with Rebecca Wittes and Kevin Porter, and it was funded by the Department of Energy. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Will now to walk us through the presentation, and I'll be looking forward to your questions at the end. Great. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, so we will uh, go ahead uh, and dive in. And so just a kind of a generic outline of what we'll be talking about uh, today. First, want to focus in on kind of the motivation for this work and generally introduce kind of, kind of the area uh, and, and why we thought kind of um, putting together uh, this research was important. Uh, and then we will dive in kind of to the different estimation methods and data sources that we relied on to come up with kind of a bound for the transmission costs uh, that we'll get into. And, and this, the second part's uh, quite important um, given kind of the, the messiness of transmission data uh, in general. And so kind of the fact that we relied on a lot of different sources is kind of what gave us confidence um, in the results that we'll be presenting. And so this, that's what we'll get into a little bit in uh, part two. And then in part three, we'll dive in uh, to the results kind of one by one um, based on the different, uh, estimation, different estimation methods that, that we used. Uh, and then we'll have kind of a short uh, conclusion. And as Andrew mentioned, it's about 45 minute talk and then we'll leave kind of uh, 15 minutes for Q&A. So as I kind of go through this presentation, do kind of jot down, uh, write down those, those questions as they, as they come up and, and we'll try to return, return to them uh, at the end. So kind of one of the main uh, you know, motivations for this work is kind of a general statement uh, that comes from, you know, a lot of the literature that looks at increasing penetrations of renewable energy. And that kind of statement is that the future expansion of renewables uh, will require more transmission investment. Uh, and so to motivate kind of and support that statement um, with some data and analysis, I have two graphs up here. Um, both of which come out of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and some of their work. And the graph on the right uh, it comes from their standard scenario uh, modeling effort, which comes out of the REEDS model. And uh, what you see there is on the y-axis, um, uh, transmission capacity in uh, terawatt miles. And then the x-axis, years over time. And all of the different lines represent the different scenarios that they model. And in their kind of high renewable case, which sees like a 400% wind growth, uh, even more solar growth, um, has the, a significantly uh, larger portion of uh, the expenses coming from this transmission kind of capacity uh, expansion um, as opposed to, to the other cases. And so they're, they're showing here and they're explaining that, you know, to facilitate large renewable build-outs, you will also need corresponding large um, transmission capacity expansion. Uh, and you know, kind of similarly, I mean, a different, a different type of analysis, a different type of story, but um, kind of a similar uh, issue is this graph on the left, which is you know, also some in-rail work looking at the western grid and kind of a 35% uh, wind penetration rate um, under a reference case where you kind of, they assumed the um, current business as usual uh, WEC transmission planned, uh, and then corresponding increases in transmission uh, build out. And then on the X axis, you see the amount of curtailment uh, that is reduced. And so this work it was basically showing that um, with, I think in this transmission scenario one, 
Uh, they were modeling kind of four big transmission projects getting expanded that represented about 10 gigawatts of transmission capacity. Um, and it resulted in kind of a halving of, of the total curtailment. So, you know, a significant reduction um, in uh, the reduced wind, wind output. And so these kind of, both of these projects, you know, pointing to this issue that we will need kind of transmission uh, investment. And so kind of at the same time, um, when we're kind of thinking about generation technologies, the popular cost metrics like the levelized cost of energy uh, do not typically include system costs. And so on this slide, uh, I put up kind of the favorite industry uh, report uh, graph, graphic that comes out every year. This is, I think, now outdated because Lazard recently released their 2019 uh, version, but, but the point is that, you know, these, these reports come out every year about levelized cost of electricity, and it's been a really, you know, good news story uh, for, for renewable energy as those costs have significantly come down, you know, over the last 10 years to today basically being competitive with conventional energy resources. Uh, but importantly, these kind of cost estimates do not consider system infrastructure needs and system infrastructure costs. And, and, and that makes sense because kind of estimating the overall cost of transmission to integrate variable renewable energy is really challenging. It's very kind of heterogeneous. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons why you might um, install or build a transmission project. And so it's, it's very kind of hard to capture that. And so that was kind of our motivating problem. And then the pertinent questions for this research were then uh, how have uh, variable renewable energy benefited from transmission expansion in the past? Uh, and then the second question is what might transmission investments for variable renewable energy be in the future? And then finally, you know, can electric system planners facilitate optimal transmission construction? And so this research mainly focused on answering questions one and two, uh, though we think that, and that's what we're mainly going to focus on in this kind of presentation with the results and the data that, that we uh, collated. But we do think that the, this work and this research kind of has important implications for, for this third, third question. Um, and so we think it definitely inform, informs that. And so, you know, at the same time, uh, there has also been kind of an active and healthy debate over a distributed versus a utility scale future, you know, whether we should install a bunch of distributed energy resources or, or rely on large scale uh, uh, utility scale uh, power plants. And so, you know, a part of this debate are kind of a proliferation of studies that try to understand the value of DERs on the grid. And one key component of a lot of these studies is the value uh, of transmission deferral or of avoidance. And so there's, there's many, many studies that kind of try to look at this and, and, and estimate it. Uh, we've just picked kind of one here, which is uh, an E3 study uh, a consulting firm's study for, for Nevada. And you can see in kind of this uh, orange slice, they try to estimate kind of the transmission avoided cost uh, for a distributed energy uh, investment on a levelized basis. Uh, and, and, you know, in general, these kind of studies use, you know, aggregate data. They use assumptions about what transmission kind of costs. And we think that this kind of research helps, you know, inform, support, or it can be a comparison case uh, for, for these studies, in particular related kind of to transmission uh, capacity uh, and costs. And so uh, before kind of jumping into to what we did in this particular report, we think it's important to point out that this is not the first time that some of these costs ha have been uh, collected, though we do think that there are some advantages uh, to doing it um, the way the way we did in this particular study. But first thing uh, we want to point out is there was a review about 10 years ago actually up at the lab. Andrew, Andrew was on that as well as Ryan Weiser. And it was a big review of U.S. transmission planning studies. And they found that the median wind transmission costs were around $15 a megawatt hour levelized or $300 a kilowatt uh, for the unit cost, which at the time was roughly 15 to 20% of a winds project cost. Uh, additionally, there's been work that's come out of kind of Europe reviewing similar costs. Uh, also, kind of five or ten years ago, finding levelized costs between eight and thirty dollars a megawatt hour at a thirty percent VRE penetration. And then, uh, more recently, a few years ago, there was a, a study that came out that reviewed kind of the MISO interconnection data 
and found wind-related transmission costs between 50 cents to $10 uh, a megawatt hour. And so all of this work kind of uh, came out, you know, uh, in the near uh, past, and, and for the most part, a preview of our findings is that compared to this prior work, we have a similar unit cost, so a dollar per kilowatt cost, uh, with lower levelized costs, dollar per megawatt hour estimates. And we'll get into the details of, of kind of why that is, but basically the levelization being different is mainly uh, based on the assumptions we have for discount rates um, and things like that, uh, uh, which we uh, can dive into. But an additional kind of benefit of this, this work is that, uh, you know, in the last 10 years, there have been a lot of actual transmission investments that have been made, and so we take advantage uh, of that uh, in, in this uh, research. So now uh, we will jump into kind of part two, uh, which is outlining the, the estimation methods that we used uh, and the data sources that we relied on. And so, as I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier in the presentation, you know, transmission costs are um, kind of very difficult to pin down, especially difficult to kind of assign cost responsibility when you think about kind of integrating renewables on the grid. And so, so because of that, we kind of found four different methods, four different data sources um, that we think have weaknesses and strengths uh, as compared to, to one another, but kind of together in one packaged kind of research project put some reliable bounds uh, on the transmission cost estimates. And so the first source that we relied on were interconnection studies. And so we reviewed over the last 10 or 15 years all of the interconnection applications in MISO and PJM and the corresponding uh, interconnection studies that report kind of the costs that the developer of a project typically would have to pay uh, to interconnect on, on the system. And so in addition to MISO and PJM, the EIA uh, releases data on interconnection costs as well, but their data stopped in 2012. And so, so we also rely on that EIA data, um, but have a, a larger range of historical data for MISO and PJM. And so I mentioned that the cost responsibility on these projects typically is typically borne by the developer. Um, and therefore, the, these project scopes are much kind of smaller than bulk large transmission projects. So it's really just focused on an individual genera generator. Uh, the costs considered are mainly around the point of interconnection and, and the marginal bulk system investments that would be needed to integrate just the one uh, generated generation project. And so we typically you know, think of this uh, data source as having fairly limited bulk costs and then therefore potentially a lower bound estimate uh, uh, for, transmission, for transmission costs. And so the whereas the other three kind of approaches um, capture a wider array of things. And so then jumping in to those other three sources, the, the second source was simulation studies. And, um, and so these uh, are, the, are the large kind of studies that either come out of, you know, independent or regional transmission operators like ISO New England, PJM, and MISO, in which they model their system under a very high kind of renewable energy penetration and then report kind of the transmission investments that will be needed. Um, and so we reviewed a bunch of those studies as well as some of the kind of western wind integration studies or eastern wind integration studies or renewable studies that kind of come out and generally look at a broader a region and, and figure out how much transmission potentially will be needed. And so uh, the nice thing about these studies is that they model both bulk system and spur, so the, the individual kind of generator line transmission costs, and so it includes a wider array of costs. Um, but you might also think, or a key challenge, is that these are kind of ideal optimizations of a region and don't necessarily consider maybe political constraints or a detailed land constraint uh, model, and so potentially could be overly optimistic in some of the transmission buildup. And so because of that issue, we then move on to uh, these two other methods, and I'm going to jump to, to method number four, which is that we also look at the historical transmission projects that were built over the last 10 years for the explicit purpose of integrating uh, renewable energy. And so these are, you know, to, you should think about like ERCOT's CREZ lines um, or Tehachapi, which is a big transmission project to integrate wind in California. And so we review kind of all of those in the United States 
as many as at least we could find that has you know or expressed the sole purpose of being built because of uh, renewable energy but then an issue that then when thinking about kind of the costs that come out of these projects is that first it's kind of difficult to assign cost responsibility so transmission lines you know reduce congestion they increase reliability there's a lot they're a network asset uh, that even if the project was moving forward because of a renewable energy project uh, it's likely that it has other benefits that, that we're not thinking about uh, in the scope of this project uh, but then also there's to a certain extent a selection bias because we focus only on the transmission projects that were needed um, to be built to integrate renewables while kind of ignoring the fact that there might have been a lot of renewable expansion that did not require transmission investment and so th that is where kind of this third method comes in which is our aggregation method in which we try to um, identify all of a region's investment in transmission that was associated with renewable energy and then correspondingly collect the total amount of renewable energy that that region uh, has developed kind of over a certain time period and so this kind of gets away from the selection bias issue it's obviously a more coarse analysis um, but kind of uh, it can help uh, play to maybe a weakness of our fourth method um, and so kind of uh, the whole point you know of the slide and of this table is to suggest that we you know we're, we're looking at a lot of different sources that they, they do have strengths and weaknesses but they, we think they um, kind of uh, work well together and when we kind of get into the results and uh, we hope to kind of argue that there's a fairly limited range of costs that these four methods collect um, and then that range is pretty stable considering the differences uh, of all of these of all these sources and so the last slide before kind of diving into the data and the results um, is to talk quickly about the levelization levelization methods that we use um, and so in general you should think about these calculations as very similar to a levelized cost of energy but instead of kind of annualizing the capital costs of a generator project we're doing it for the capital cost of a transmission line while still assuming you know a capacity factor uh, of a renewable energy asset and then we include kind of there are two equations here because there's uh, two slightly different data sets that we, we have to rely on and the first one is kind of just one capital cost for an individual transmission project and so all we have to do there is we annualize that one capital cost and then calculate the annual amount of renewable energy that will flow over that line um, and so that's equation one and then in equation two um, this is more to deal with kind of this aggregation approach that last method that I talked about where we're looking at renewable energy development over time as well as as well as transmission investment over time and so we have to do some discounting over a time period and so that's all that's the only difference uh, between equations one and two and then I, you know I mentioned earlier that we this study came up with different levelized costs as compared to prior estimates and that is mainly due to kind of this third bullet uh, on this slide where we talk about the discount rate and we are assuming the 4.4 percent discount rate which is based on uh, real not nominal so real interest rates in the utility industry where we take kind of historical return on equity return on debt the standard kind of debt to equity ratio in the utility industry um, and calculate this 4.4 uh, percent and so that that's kind of the main driver of, of that difference and then in the paper you know if you're interested in uh, it we also had a sensitivity with a lower discount rate um, which you know potentially could be argued is you know more appropriate for an investment that has societal benefits and so um, because of that we, we do include a little bit of a sensitivity and then our assumption is that the lifetime of this transmission asset will be 60 years okay so now uh, I want to jump into kind of the results and uh, we're going to split this up by the different uh, approaches uh, that were used in this study and so first want to jump in to the interconnection study results then we'll focus on approaches two and four which were the simulation studies and actual projects and then finally uh, talk about the aggregation method so on this slide uh, I plot the uh, graph for each data source um, so I mentioned that we reviewed MISO's interconnection queue and PJM's interconnection queue as well as data from the EIA 
And on the y-axis, you can see the levelized cost of energy, uh, or levelized cost of transmission, rather, um, in 2018 dollars. And then on the x-axis, different generator types that, that we reviewed in these interconnection studies. And kind of the first thing that I want you all to notice is that, you know, when you compare these three different graphs, there are disparate data sources. Uh, even though we use the same estimation method, they're, you know, independent data. And in general, we saw a decent amount of agreement from each three data source. And so we were pretty confident in kind of these interconnection results. The second thing you'll notice, or we want you to notice, is that in general, the interconnection costs for wind and solar were higher than the costs uh, for kind of the conventional generation resources. And so you kind of see a range between $1 and $2 a megawatt hour for wind and solar, whereas you know, other generating resources are $0.50 cents or, or lower. And then finally, uh, the thing to which was somewhat of a surprise for us, was that the cost uh, for solar to interconnect on a levelized basis, at least, it was higher uh, than wind. And, and we think there's, there's a few explanations uh, for this. The first is just that the capacity factors for the solar resource is lower than the wind resource in, in most of these, or all of these regions. And so that kind of, kind of result in a factor of two difference in a levelized cost estimate. But the other thing that, that's kind of important to, to point out, uh, uh, especially you know when f focusing in on PJM, where you see like a really big difference between wind and solar, is that you know all interconnections are not made equal. And what we focus on here is kind of the energy megawatts that were requested in an interconnection application. You know, but there is also a kind of request for capacity during peak times, and solar. Uh, is typically trying to participate in capacity markets more. It's peakier during kind of more corresponds more to load than than the wind resources. And in PJM in particular, we saw that you know the solar resource was requiring much more capacity during peak times. And so even though um, they might request the same amount of general energy transmission, that capacity amount is different. And so that is probably one additional explanation uh, for why why solar. With a little bit more, uh, but kind of considering kind of all of that detail, I think it is important to point out that these interconnection costs are low compared to the total levelized cost of energy for generation technologies. And so, when thinking of wind and solar, if you go back to the Lazard reports, you're looking at an LCOE between 30 and 50 dollars a megawatt hour. And so, you know, when you're looking at a levelized cost of interconnection between one and two dollars a megawatt hour, um, that is uh, you know just a small portion uh, of those expenses, and so the last kind of uh, point that we wanted to look into for these interconnection costs was to see if there was any variability over geographic space uh, or over time. And so if uh, you look to the maps on the left, you can see that in general there was limited kind of geographic heterogeneity, um, but there was a little bit um, for wind. And you kind of can see in North Dakota, South Dakota, as well as Maine, those unit costs, so the dollar per kilowatt costs, we've moved away from the levelized numbers. Those unit costs are higher, and that could in part be explained by the fact that you know, these, these are not load centers typically, and so historically might, or currently, do not necessarily have the strongest kind of transmission backbone. And so that fact can potentially be one explanation for, for why those transmission costs uh, were higher. Though, though we did not uh, kind of dive deeply into, into verifying kind of that hypothesis, but, but this is what the data suggested. And then kind of turning to the graph on, on the right, you can see the unit costs of the three different generating technologies over time. And so if you focus on you know, the first four sections of this bar chart where uh, which represent kind of actual constructed projects that are, are, are being operated today. You can see that wind unit costs haven't changed that dramatically over time. Natural gas hasn't changed that dramatically over time. And, and we really don't have enough data on solar to, to really have a statement about that. But then if you look at this kind of last section, which is the proposed section, you see that wind costs kind of pretty dramatically uh, in, increase. And we think, you know, there are two, you know, hypotheses that we had uh, for, for that. 
Um, and, and the first could be that, you know, it, it could be the case that the, the transmission system has kind of been saturated uh, and, and transmission costs to interconnect could be more uh, going, going forward. But we also think that potentially more, more likely and, and something that is happening in these, these data sets is that there is somewhat of an interconnection queue game uh, you know, that is being played. And the developers of, of projects don't necessarily know where it's going to be most expensive to interconnect uh, their, their you know, wind project. And so they you know, apply to interconnect and they wait to get the report back from the regional transmission operator. And those reports say you know, it's going to be really expensive to interconnect or it's not going to be expensive. And so then there's some selection that happens by, by the developers. And so when you look at the past, those are all of the projects that moved forward and were actually built, and clearly those costs were significantly lower. You know, the queues are, are really inundated you know, right now, and so it could be the case that, that some of these projects will not ultimately go forward um, and that uh, that selection would uh, result in kind of, if we had corresponding like 2019 or 2020 numbers, uh, would be in line with kind of what you've seen his historically. And so that's something to at least think about when comparing that proposed bar to the, the historical bars. Great, so that's uh, everything we have for the interconnection studies. And now I kind of want to move on to the second and fourth approaches, which are the simulation studies and then the actual projects we reviewed. And we're going to split this up by generating resource. And so first, this slide focuses on wind projects, so transmission projects associated with wind. And I want to walk through the graph a little bit. Uh, on the y-axis, uh, there are some kind of uh, fairly I mean, esoteric or uh, uncomprehensible acronyms. Um, and, but what these represent are kind of acronyms of actual constructed projects in the top section. So you can maybe see CREZ, Tehachapi's there, MISO's multi-value projects, SPP's priority projects, um, so all of the different kind of projects that have been constructed today. Then the middle section, the gray bars, are proposed projects, um, proposed, proposed transmission projects for renewables. And then the last section is different simulation studies that we reviewed. And so that's what's on the x axis or the y axis. Uh, on the bottom x axis, you'll see transmission costs in, in the levelized basis, and those correspond to the bars, so the blue, gray, and teal bars. And then finally, the top uh, uh, x axis corresponds to the incremental wind capacity that was analyzed, analyzed in either the project or the study, and those correspond to the red kind of dots that you see. And so that's what's going on kind of in this project. And so what you'll see, you know, at first glance is that proposed projects uh, were the most expensive uh, that we reviewed, followed by constructed transmission projects, and then finally simulation studies. And so proposed projects are, were around $12 a megawatt hour, constructed projects around seven, and then finally simulation studies around, around four. And again, you know, kind of have in the back of your mind kind of those issues that we were talking about earlier in the, in the presentation, whereas, you know, there might be a uh, selection bias in some of the projects that we were looking at. Simulation studies, you know, represent kind of an optimized view uh, of, of the region uh, that were assessed. And so that potentially explains some of the differences that, that we're seeing here. But the other thing that I really want to highlight on this, on this slide is that it is very difficult to assign kind of cost responsibility appropriately. And so what, what I mean by that is, you know, when these transmission projects are built, even if they have the explicit purpose of being developed for renewable energy, it is also the case that once built, the regional transmission operator can use them in a way that reduces congestion, so has some economic value outside of integrating a generation resource. And it also increases electric reliability. And so, uh, you know, it's a network resource. And what we do here you know, in this analysis is we assign full cost responsibility onto uh, these transmission lines. And so um, for that reason, we kind of typically think of these costs that we're estimating here as potentially upper bounds on, on the actual transmission costs. 
when, when we're focused on these, these constructed projects. In part, that's because of the selection bias, which, which I mentioned, but also in part because of this challenge to assign cost responsibility. So moving on uh, to talk about uh, solar. In general, we found that it was the same story for solar as it was for wind on the previous slide, but there was much less kind of data uh, involved that we could kind of bring to task on, on the analysis. And so there were only four actual transmission projects that had enough certainty to kind of to report here. Um, and, and, and that's partly potentially explained by the fact that you know, there's a hypothesis that solar resources are being located closer to load and therefore might not need as much of a transmission investment. But it's also the case that there's just been significantly less solar installed as compared to wind. So in, in 2010, you know, when, when some of those wind projects were getting developed and built, you know, the ratio was 40 to 1 of utility scale wind to solar. And then by 2017, or you know, more recently, that, that ratio has grown, but there's still, or the ratio has kind of collapsed between wind and solar, but it's still the case that significantly more wind has been, been built. And so that, that can be kind of one explanation. You know, but in general, we're still finding levelized cost of transmission between $5 and $15 a megawatt hour, which is fairly in line with, with the cost that we found for wind. Um, and uh, so, you know, even though there's less data, uh, we still think that uh, we're fairly confident in that, in that range, that number that we've, we've developed. Okay, and so finally, we want to dive into the kind of aggregation uh, results, and we'll kind of present these results uh, by three different regions. So we looked at the U.S.-wide uh, aggregation calculation, and then we also looked at California and Texas in particular, and so we'll jump, we'll jump into those three things. But before jumping into those numbers, uh, we want to kind of give a little bit more clarity and a little bit more detail of how this method um, uh, was used. And so the first step is to collect a region-wide time series of renewable energy transmission expenditures and calculate the net present value of those expenditures in the region. Step two is then to collect a region-wide number for the amount of renewable energy generation that uh, took place over time uh, in that same region. And then we just divide the number from step one uh, by step two. And so kind of in this method, the, the hardest part or the most you know, challenging part is step one, to, to kind of understand what the region-wide time series of VRE transmission expenditures were. Uh, well, I'll dive into what we did in California and Texas, but this, the graph that I show here on this slide gives you a little bit of intuition about what we do when we're doing the U.S.-wide kind of calculation. And we rely on EIA Form 411. And this form reports proposed transmission projects in the United States over time. And in 2008, they started to report the key reason for those transmission project proposals. And so before 2008, you kind of see bars that are all kind of washed out gray because it was not reported, but then the color appears and they break out the reasons for deployment in kind of five key categories, which is the first and kind of the most prevalent one is reliability. The second being economics. So think of kind of congestion relief. The third in red is renewable energy integration. And then uh, the final two, which are you know, significantly smaller, are non-renewable energy generation as well as kind of an other catch-all category. And so we basically use this percentage um, as a means to estimate the total amount of uh, transmission expenditures that are associated with renewable energy. Obviously, you know, it has some limitations. These are proposed projects, not actually built projects. So, you know, that, that's what we're kind of getting at in this course analysis with there's just limited high-level data available. Um, but what we hope to, to show you is that the numbers we generate using this very different method is actually fairly in line with all the numbers you've, you've seen so far. And so let's 
jump into those numbers. And so when we do this kind of analysis that I've just described on a US-wide basis, we've got a levelized cost of transmission of around $7 a megawatt hour. And this is for solar and wind combined into one. And again, it uses this reason for transmission expansion to basically, um, uh, uh, I guess, sample out the renewable energy focused transmission expenditure. And so that's what you're seeing in this graph on the right is we get data from FERC Form 1 as well as um, the Edison Electric Institute, which kind of reports total transmission expenditure in the United States over time. And then we use those percentages that we showed on the previous slide to calculate the amount associated with renewable energy transmission. And that's where we get the $7 a megawatt hour, which, which actually fits in quite well when compared to the simulation studies and the actual project costs that we reviewed. Uh, I also, we are reporting kind of results uh, for the ERCOT region here as well. And in this case, we kind of report a range, um, again, that are within kind of the results that we've previously shown, which, but the, the, we report a range between kind of 8 and $4 a megawatt hour uh, to highlight the selection bias issue that we've been talking about a, a little bit. So in, in ERCOT, this is kind of wind only, and uh, we focus only on the capital cost for the CREZ lines, uh, which were built out um, with the explicit purpose of integrating wind. And kind of when those uh, lines were proposed and then built out, there was a number that was a, so, uh, a number of gigawatts of wind that were associated with building out of those, those lines. Um, but at the same time, there is a certain amount of wind that just exists on Texas's system that were kind of separate from that CREZ, CREZ build-out. And so this range is basically due to the fact that it depends on how many gigawatts of wind you are using to levelize those transmission expenditures that were made uh, in, in, the, in the region. And so that, that range is pretty large. You know, it's a factor of two um, when you kind of include all of the wind that exists on Texas's system. Um, and, and that's kind of important to highlight to kind of show you what this selection bias issue kind of means uh, in, in a nitty gritty kind of uh, number. Uh, but at the same time, even though that range is fairly large relative to itself, it's still kind of within the ballpark of the transmission costs that we've kind of been collecting, you know, with the actual transmission projects as well as the US wide estimate. Um, and so, you know, we were happy to see that even with kind of a different method, we're getting a similar, similar number. And then finally, I uh, want to report kind of the California aggregation, which is on, a, on the upper end of, of the aggregation results, around $8 a megawatt hour. Um, but the way that we do this is that the California Public Utility Commission actually reports all of the transmission projects that were needed to reach uh, RPS target of 33%. And so what we do is we take all of these projects, we find their corresponding costs, and then we levelize them based on California reaching that 33% RPS uh, target. And so that's how we come up with this kind of $8 a megawatt hour number. Uh, and so, so while this aggregated number is important, it kind of fits in the, the story that we've been telling so far about what these costs uh, look like, it's also important to note that Sunrise PowerLink and the Tehachapi transmission lines accounted for almost 75% of the transmission expenditure in California to reach these targets, uh, but did not account for 75% of the energy uh, that is associated with, with reaching these targets. And so, you know, the aggregation can kind of hide, you know, some of these large transmission project investments that, are, that were needed to integrate, you know, kind of a large resource. Um, so that's kind of an important or interesting kind of finding that came out of this, this work. And then the other kind of you know, open question to just highlight, you know, the difficulty of doing this, this aggregation method is that the number that we report here, this $8 number, kind of only includes renewables within the state of California. Um, but it could be the case that these transmission investments that were made within the state of California actually facilitated the integration of renewables outside of California. And so, you know, so there's still a question of, you know, what do you levelize these capital cost investments by? Um, we did that analysis. It's in the paper. It doesn't really change the results that much, but that's kind of another one of the issues that, that we grappled with when thinking about this aggregation approach. And so now uh, I want to uh, conclude um, 
and keep in mind we'll, we'll have about five or 10 to 15 minutes uh, for, for, for questions, so please do kind of think about that as, as I'm uh, preparing some of these concluding uh, remarks. And so, so what did, how do we kind of um, summarize or think about all this data that we collected and aggregated and compared to each other? And so we built a summary graphic, which we show here on this slide, to kind of tell this, this story. And overall, kind of we found that the average cost for transmission investments range from $1 to $10 a megawatt hour. Um, and we kind of showed the four different uh, data sources, methods that we used, and kind of the, where they fall, you know, on this range. And so this is, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, that, we, you know, the interconnection studies were lower, you know, or they're in this $1 megawatt hour range, but they might not include all of the costs. Um, and so that's kind of our lower bound estimate. And then we have the individual projects that we looked at, which might have the selection issue, also this cost responsibility issue. And so we're finally somewhere around $10 a megawatt hour. Um, but we're fairly confident kind of in this bound of costs. And so things to consider when thinking about this range is that you should compare them to the levelized cost of energy for wind and solar. And so those costs are between kind of $30 and $60 a megawatt hour. And so as I mentioned earlier, those, these interconnection studies, you know, are, are a pretty small portion of this, this cost, whereas the kind of individual project approach and, and individual large bulk investments, you know, start to become, you know, a significant portion uh, of the levelized cost uh, of, of energy, even though, you know, it is an upper bound um, of these cost estimates. Uh, but it's also important to realize that, you know, as the LCOEs continue to fall, the system costs might become bigger and bigger portions of kind of the overall cost um, uh, for, for renewable energy. But again, you know, really want to stress that it is difficult to find cost responsibility, especially on those individual project kind of method. Uh, so it's something to qualify uh, that, that statement. Um, also important to stress that the simulation method, um, one reason that it might be lower than kind of realized costs that you see in the individual project method and the aggregation method is that they kind of represent an idealized optimization. Um, and so, you know, might not be fully capturing all of the, you know, real constraints that exist uh, on the system. So also important to notice or note that there is a difference kind of between bulk and interconnection investments, and that's kind of floating around in the background of these, you know, aggregate numbers that we're reporting here. Um, but, you know, some would argue that, you know, the interconnection costs are somewhat separate from these bulk investments, and so maybe we should, you know, add the interconnection costs to the individual projects. And, you know, on one hand, that might be appropriate, but on the other hand, these interconnection studies do sometimes include bulk transmission investments, and so it's hard to, you know, fully capture um, that, that, dis that distinction here. And so for this research, we kind of left them all separate. And then the final kind of qualification caveat to mention here, which we think is a pretty pretty big one, is that everything that we've talked about today only considers capital costs. So we kind of ignore operation and maintenance costs, which regional tra transmission operators do um, do expend when kind of managing the transmission network. And you know, we started down the path of trying to collect some uh, estimates for what these O and M costs would look like, but you know, if assigning cost responsibility was challenging, you know, when thinking about capital costs, it's very challenging when thinking about O&M costs. And so, so we decided kind of against integrating that in this, in this work, but, you know, what limited research we were compiling showed is that these costs are, can be substantial and are not negligible. And so kind of future work should consider this, and, and these numbers that we report here likely are larger um, due to this operation and maintenance cost uh, issue. And so just kind of to leave you with the big takeaways that um, we talked about uh, in the last 40 minutes, um, we kind of opened up this presentation uh, with a discussion of how the future of uh, renewable expansion will require transmission investment. And kind of this past work has shown that, you know, transmission investment will be needed to reach kind of renewable energy policy targets, uh, as well as needed to reduce uh, renewable curtailment. Uh, in the kind of the results section, we presented uh, data that suggested that the average transmission capital costs range from one 
to $10 a megawatt hour. But importantly, this does not include O&M expenses, which we think is kind of a ripe area for future work. And then the other thing that we, we didn't talk about too much is that, you know, in this, in this research and what we presented, you know, we did not consider a full cost-benefit analysis. Uh, you know, that, that would really, a framework that would allow, you know, someone who's trying to develop or propose a transmission project to really kind of assess kind of the costs and benefits when thinking about congestion um, reliability and different uh, things like that. So we do think like the work that we did here and the coalition that we did here is obviously an important component of any fully considered cost-benefit analysis. Um, uh, we, you can't directly use these numbers to like suggest moving forward on a particular project. And so that also, you know, is an area for future work. And then finally, you know, just kind of want to leave you all with uh, this notion that, uh, you know, these, these costs, um, can be can be substantial, and um, it kind of matters whether or not you know you're you're thinking about an actual transmission project or a simulation study to kind of decide uh, for or a system planner might use to decide a transmission investment. But but regardless of these differences, we think you know system planners will need to consider the transmission needs today to meet to meet those renewable transmission or. To, to meet renewable expansion priorities in, in the future. And we think that these numbers that we kind of collected here kind of informs and contextualizes the system level integration costs that, that, that policymakers might be looking at, and, you know, in the near term when making decisions, it might contextualize those uh, kind of among what has been seen in the United States, uh, as well as inform kind of this distributed versus utility scale uh, debate. And so with all of that, I think we have about 12 minutes uh, for questions. Thank you all for kind of signing in and, and listening. And um, I think Andrew has been, been collecting them, and so uh, we can kind of step through those uh, one by one. Great. Okay. Thank you, Will. Um, yeah, so let's just jump right in. We've got a number of questions that have come through already, but uh, I'll continue to monitor this as, as we're answering these. So if you have any additional ones, please uh, throw them in there. Um, the first one is just if you could comment on the 4.4% discount uh, rate assumption, and it seemed like that was a little low. So mm -hmm. could you explain mm -hmm. a little bit more of, of where that comes from? And yeah, yeah, great. Um, yeah, so so we, we definitely kind of kind of heard that definitely when we were just starting out on this work that this is low, but it was informed. The first thing to point out is that it's the real discount rate. So it's not a nominal number, which would be higher, you know, around six or seven percent, which I think is a number that you know maybe appears more uh, in kind of industry reports and things. But we wanted to levelize everything to 2018 dollars, and so to do that, it was in real terms, and so that affects uh, one of the, is one of the reasons kind of why it's on, on the low rate. But uh, the details are, are in the paper, but we do want to stress that we use kind of a 10%, 11% return on equity, um, and we use maybe a 3%, 4% uh, return on debt, and then we use a 65 to uh, uh, 35 debt to equity ratio. And so we, we kind of calculate that 4.4% using kind of the industry standard, but I think one of the reasons it's low is that this is a real discount rate rather than a nominal one, uh, which, would, which would be higher. Great. Okay. And the next question is related to that to some degree, uh, is that um, the question is mostly around the megawatt hours that go into the denominator of these calculations. Uh, and you, you noted in there that it's a 60-year transmission life assumption, but in you're doing that, that megawatt hours, is that over the sort of more 30-year range of the generation book life, or is that over the 60-year range of the transmission mm -hmm. book life? Yeah, and that's, so that's great. Great question. Uh, the way we to think about kind of those megawatt hours is it is over the 60-year life. And so when you're thinking of – so the assumption kind of inherently baked into that is that after 30 years when that renewable project uh, potentially uh, expires, is the assumption is that a new renewable project will kind of come online and produce a similar amount of megawatt hours at a similar capacity factor that we assumed kind of in year, in year one. And because the way that we do this calculation is we, you know, let's say you have a $5 billion transmission investment, we annualize that number over 60 years, um, but then that renewable energy number is just the capacity factor um, multiplied by the megawatts to come out with if that transmission line was producing energy only uh, to meet kind of 
the capacity factor of that renewable energy project. So, so there's no like, it's not a discounting that ne necessarily is affected by that 30, 60 year difference in the megawatt hour number, um, but it is assumed that that line will continue to produce renewable energy over 60 years. Great, okay. Um, the next question is, could you comment on how the four different approaches differ on the degree to which they capture private costs, which are borne by the projects themselves, versus sort of our external or socialized costs? Mm -hmm. It seems like the interconnection cost examples are mostly private and shouldn't be factored into these more public policy analysis. Uh, and, um, and related to the selection bias issue, shouldn't it only apply if the costs are private? Um, and, uh, and just kind of help out with this consistency. Sure, yeah. Um, so I think so you've kind of uh, hit the distinction well. I think when thinking about private costs, mainly these interconnection costs are the ones that are private, whereas kind of the other three methods uh, include those socialized costs. So a few of the simulation studies did include spur lines, and spur lines are typically borne by private developers as well. And so there's a, there's a little bit of private costs and those other three approaches, but, but mainly the socialized ones. But uh, kind of the thing to keep in mind here, especially you know when thinking about those proposed uh, interconnections that we saw for wind being really expensive, is that there's a there's a relationship between how expensive it is to interconnect privately and how much public investment has been made in the transmission network. So MISO's multi-value project and SPP's priority projects, those were big transmission bulk projects that were socialized across load in those regions, um, but those projects led to lower interconnection costs because now the bulk costs um, have kind of been socialized before. And so there's definitely, you know, the more social public investment you make, the lower it is to privately develop or to pri privately interconnect. And so there is a relationship there that's kind of important to point out um, that, the, that those are related. Um, and then, so I guess, Related to the, the selection bias issue, um, I guess, uh, so uh, understanding if they're only, um, only apply if the costs are private. I mean, I think the, the, the issue here is just the way that we've assigned cost responsibility um, on these capital cost investments for, for transmission is that it's important to note that that was a bulk socialized investment that the public decided to make. Um, and if those are only being used to integrate kind of renewables, that levelized cost is still like the right number uh, to consider because this is the total amount of investment made by the public to integrate the renewables via this, this transmission project. So um, it's, it's definitely the case that the people who bear those costs are different. And so there's, you know, the incentives are different and uh, how the decisions made uh, are different, but we do think that selection bias still is, in, is happening in those social social costs because we're only picking projects that had um, ex the explicit purpose to integrate a renewable energy resources, whereas there are some renewables that didn't need social costs to be invested in. Okay, great. And, and kind of related to that one in the method slide where you showed sort of some of the different uh, methods across um, the, the, the four of them, you, you did mention something about difficulties in assigning cost responsibility. Could you just kind of explain what you meant by that in the context of that method slide? Yes. Yeah, so what, what I mean uh, by that and, and what we were trying to highlight with that is that, you know, you can build a, a transmission project is not kind of built in a vacuum. It's built onto a network and um, there are many people that might benefit from, from that. So in general, for, so one example of that is congestion, economic congestion could be reduced. So even though a transmission project might have been built, or at least stated to have been built to integrate a renewable energy resource, it is also the case that it's gonna reduce congestion and therefore wholesale market prices. And so it could benefit kind of load in another region because prices have been decreased. And so what I, what I mean by that is to potentially that transmission project some of those costs might need to have been borne by load or, um, you know, consumers of electricity who kind of benefit from this reduced congestion or benefit from uh, increased reliability. Uh, and so maybe they should pay for some of those transmission costs. But we've kind of assigned full cost responsibility to the renewable energy project. And so you know, potentially you could think that the cost 
uh, for to integrate renewables could be a little lower, given that the renewable project isn't fully responsible for extracting the benefits of a transmission line. And so this gets a little bit into this cost-benefit analysis like framework and, and, and thinking about it, but that, that's kind of what we are meaning by cost responsibility. Okay, great. And then I'm going to kind of group uh, a couple of questions here together, which is to begin with just what's your judgment on how incremental transmission costs might increase in the future with increasing wind and solar? And then partly related to that, is there any distinction we should be making about onshore versus offshore wind when it comes to transmission? And has storage kind of factored into any of these analysis? Will storage play a role in transmission uh, needs and costs? Right. Um, yeah, so I'll take those kind of one by one and so first focus on uh, kind of future transmission expenditures. And, th and that, so that's a, it's a very important question and it's one we kind of grappled with and we tried to use some of the data that we had to kind of get get at this to see if like at least in the last 10 or 15 years has, has anything changed over time that would then suggest in the future that, that cost would increase. And so with the historic data that we looked at, we didn't see really any time trends. And so, you know, if you extrapolate that to the future, that might suggest that, you know, these, these costs will uh, stay fairly constant as compared to what we report here. But it's just hard, you know, projecting and forecasting the future is very challenging and, you know, in a in the 20% in, in the renewable world that we live in today, uh, it's much lower than you know some of the projections that we're going we're gonna to have in 30 and 50 years, and so that could dramatically change the, the transmission network as we have to go to further and further resources because um, we've been focused on the ones that are closest to load today. So it's really ha hard to say. So I think to answer that, I would say that we didn't we haven't seen any inkling of a trend at least in the last 10 or 15 years that costs have increased, but that doesn't necessarily mean that costs wouldn't increase in the future. And then I think there is a distinction between offshore and onshore wind. Uh, for this work, it was definitely only onshore wind. We did not have any offshore projects, so it would probably be a mistake to suggest that these would be the transmission costs to integrate offshore wind. Um, but the other thing to think about here is that most of the onshore wind that has been developed have been in the plains region that, you know, it's not, not uh, it's, it's fairly spread out and not the wind resource is not necessarily close to load. Um, Whereas onshore wind is oftentimes being developed, you know, along the coastal areas, which are closer to load, um, but at the same time, then have an underground, you know, subsea transmission line, which might have more expensive costs. And so, I think first, just you should probably shouldn't use these data for an offshore wind calculation. Um, and there are reasons to believe that offshore wind could be different, both that it's closer to load, so maybe it's cheaper, but also because the technology might be more advanced because of the water issues and so it could be more expensive and so I uh, don't really have a, can't tell you which direction it will be, but those are things to consider. And then the last, remind me of the last storage. Question. Oh, storage, yeah. right. Yeah, so, the, and that, so that, that is a big question because I think one way to think about storage is it's, it can almost be a competitor uh, of, of transmission and that you, if you can pocket storage in a congested area, you might be able to avoid kind of a transmission asset being, being constructed, um, but, but I still think, you know, uh, the issue there is kind of longer, it depends on the duration of the storage that you have access to, and so a short duration storage unit probably is not going to provide kind of the seasonal deliverability that a wind resource might need or a solar might, resource might need, and so I think the trade-off there will be, you know, is if long duration storage is um, kind of comes uh, to being in a low cost way, then there's going to be some significant competition. And you know, presumably, it could lower these transmission costs or avoid these transmission costs. Um, and so, I think the way I, that I think about it is, uh, storage is a, a competitor uh, to, to the need for transmission investment. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Will, and thank you everybody for your questions. It is the top of the hour, so there's a few that we didn't quite get to, but we'll follow up with an email uh, with you directly to, to answer some of those questions. And again, thank you. Uh, we will look forward to uh, having you on our next webinars. Take care. Have a good day.